is age-associated cognitive decline inevitable? Because I think, I think maybe, well, do, do people think that it's inevitable? Raise your hand if you think it's inevitable. Okay, so a smattering of people, yeah. That's what I thought for a long time, even after I entered the field, at, at least at, you know, in our current state of the art for medicine. And I think that comes from this, these sorts of plots, where um, here on the bottom, uh, the x-axis is age, and from 35 to 85. And then here is estimated memory change. And they're measuring two types of memory, episodic and semantic memory. You can see it looks like it's pretty much downhill from 35 onwards. <laughs> so that's not good. Um, but as it turns out, that's for a population. If you look at any particular individual, the curve could look like this. Um, actually, uh, at age 35, that's not even at the peak. There's a peak of memory um, in this individual at age 60, and then with aging at age 85, it kind of you go back down to where you were when you were 35. So that's that is optimism inducing, right? So how do we go from this sort of relentless downhill trajectory to what we would want the individual change? So in order to understand that, um, scientists and epidemiologists and public health um, 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 public health investigators for years have tried to understand what actually contributes to cognitive decline. And we know that age is one of the contributors. We also know that having less education um, from an epidemiological point of view makes it more likely that you'll have cognitive decline with age. Um, comorbid <laughs> medical conditions like heart condition, vascular disease, inflammatory conditions, those can also contribute to cognitive decline. A big one that's in the news a lot now is repetitive head injuries or concussions. And there's this idea of this thing called chronic traumatic encephalopathy now, which is still a little bit, um, I mean, I think it's true, but there's still um, a little bit of controversy around it. And then, more recently, we understand that there's a big genetic contribution um, to sort of cognitive and brain health over time. So then the natural follow-up question is, how can one increase the odds of successful cognitive aging? That's why you're all here, right? <laughs> so I'm going to give you some good news. There are ways that we can enhance our likelihood of um, successful cognitive aging. The first one is education, both through the through sort of um, elementary school to through college. Like I said, if um, if less education can predispose to the to increased likelihood of cognitive decline, then more education is actually protective. We're not sure why that is. It may be that there are more redundant connections or synapses, um, and one develops a cognitive reserve. Um, we're not sure. Um, Number two, social engagement somehow is good for brain health, um, as well as mental activity. Now, none of these are surprising, but um, I, I thought that I should congratulate you all, because at the mini medical school, you're getting all three of these, right? You're getting education and social engagement and some mental activity, hopefully. I'll try not to bore you. Um, and minimizing stress is also good for brain health. So I'll tell you right now, there's no test at the end of this. Um, lecture, okay? So we can all relax. Other things that are good for brain health. Good sleep. There's some secret sauce in sleep um, that helps to consolidate memories, um, to modulate um, sort of our brain circuits. So optimizing sleep is important. Um, moderation in food and alcohol. Um, I don't, I never say, you know, just eat a plant-based diet because I think even though it's good for you, we gotta live a little bit. Um, and there are some studies that m alcohol in moderation um, can actually be um, protective for brain health. Probably the most important thing on this list though, and I'm gonna make no bones about it, is physical exercise. If I could pick one of these things, I'd say go run marathons or you know, go do exercise every day. I really can't emphasize enough how important regular physical exercise is for brain health. And um, scientists have been trying for years to try and understand what it is about physical exercise that protects the brain. And there's some idea that exercise causes um, a neuroprotective chemical to be released into the brain. And in, um, there's actually a study that's based out of Stanford where they're trying to, they're in phase one or phase two trials now 
um, to activate the receptor for that brain chemical. But physical exercise, just do it naturally. Why take a pill when you can go out for a walk on Chrissy Field, right? And then, of course, comes the question, are there any medicines that can improve brain health? And I'm going to tell you right now, I, my patients send me articles and links and questions about all kinds of these nutraceuticals that are on the market right now. And none of them are placebo-controlled trials. And I, what I usually say is, I can't recommend this. I worry that it's someone taking advantage of preying on our fears of losing brain health. Um, if it's not super expensive and it's not harmful, I'm not going to stop you from taking it. But right now, there's nothing out there that I think um, is, is actually worth the money. And, and there are even, you know, I mean, there are all these um, books written. In, and, and for the, you know, the ones that say exercise and stay active, those are good. But the ones that say buy 100 pills that I'm going to sell you, those are not good. Okay.